family. Hey, uh, according to a recent survey, three out of four Americans proclaim that they believe in God. Three out of four Americans proclaim that they believe in God. Uh, seven out of 10, 70 percent of people actually believe that Jesus is God's son, that he is the son of God. Seven out of 10 people. However, I think you might agree with me today that 70% of people in our nation, 7 out of 10 people that you know, are not living a life according to the teachings of Jesus. You see, the reality is we live in a culture today, we live in a world and even in a nation where people proclaim to believe in God, but yet so many people believe that if, or live as if God doesn't even exist at all. So today we're starting a brand new set of conversations called The Unsaved Christian. And you might have heard that, read that, see that, and you go, what in the world is that? Well, an unsaved Christian is someone who believes in God, claims to be a Christian, but ultimately lives as if God doesn't exist. You see, we live in a culture now where most people believe that if you say grace before dinner, vote your values, support prayer in schools, own a Bible, attend church occasionally, try not to cuss too much, and kind of get misty-eyed at baseball games when they sing God Bless America, you're probably doing all right. But the reality is that so many people believe in God, but yet they don't live as if he is really Lord and Savior of their life. And I might argue today that the unsaved Christian is now perhaps the largest unreached people group with the true gospel in the United States. So today we're starting this brand new set of conversations, and I want to open up with a verse today. It's a verse from Scripture that really kind of sets the tone for where we're going today and, and where we'll be going over the next few weeks. This verse is Paul writing to his friend Titus, and he's writing about these folks, and, and he's writing, describing these people um, who, who says, he says they, they live with meaningless talk. In other words, they're a whole lot of talk, but their actions don't line up with what they're saying. And so here's what Paul says about these people. Look at it on the screen. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says this, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. And then he goes on to say, they are now detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. See, today I think is really one of the most important messages that I could ever preach, because today I'm going to talk to those people who believe in God, but don't really know him. Those people who claim to be a Christian, but yet really are living as what we might call today an unsaved Christian. A pastor by the name of Dean and Sarah uh, has written a book that I've been reading recently that's kind of sparked a lot of the thought towards our conversation today about the unsaved Christian. So I'll kind of set it up this way. In October of 2016, um, my wife and I's minds begin to be opened towards this idea of adoption. We had thought about adoption uh, a decent amount leading up to that point, but never taken any really serious action towards that. But then one night, my wife had a conversation with my then three-year-old son, Braylon, that began to spark some conversation around adoption again. Well, the very next day, my wife, as many of you do, is scrolling all right, on Facebook, and she runs across this post right here. The post was put up by the Mississippi Heart Gallery, and you can see it was for a girl named Caitlin. And, and Caitlin's description read this way, that she was a 14-year-old a teenage girl who longed for a two-parent family with unconditional love. She would love to be the oldest sibling, um, and she wanted a family who was really involved in church. Well, as my wife and I read that, we're like, check, 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 all the way down the list. And over the next few days and weeks, we began to realize, and it became very clear, that God was calling us to pursue Caitlin. And so we began to walk through this whole process of filling out all this paperwork and having home studies and talking to social workers and going to these meetings and having conversations with people who, who had fostered and who had adopted, all to pursue this girl that we had never even met, except for one really brief encounter that my wife had with her. And so we, we, our minds began to be blown. We started imagining, like, what, what's this going to look like? What would it look like to have, have a second kid now come into our family and a teenage girl on top of that? Hello, somebody, okay? Like, we're, we're reimagining our house. Like, where is she going to be in the house? Like, this will be her room. Where are we going to get the furniture? Where would she sleep? Where would she go to school? How would our life be different? We got two schedules to manage and not just one child. Like, what are we going to do? All of this around pursuing this one girl who we had never really met. See, we believed in her. We knew about her, 
but we didn't really know her well. We finally ended up having two um, really brief and quite honestly kind of like awkward meetings with her. You see, Caitlin was a teenager, and so the state had given her the opportunity to choose. They weren't just going to place her, but she was going to get a chance to make a choice, and we had found out that there were dozens of other families who were interested in her. And so you can imagine, like, these, these meetings that we're having in her where we're hanging out, it's like we, we don't want to kind of, like, oversell ourselves, but at the same time, we're trying to make this really good first impression to a 14-year-old girl that we never met before. We're like, man, I'm pretty sure God told us to come after you. He's like, oh, I don't know about all that, okay? So it was this awkward conversation that was going on. But, but finally, after two months of waiting and, and, and praying, going like, God, is this it? Is this? On Valentine's Day 2017, we got word that Kate picked us. Out of over 40 plus families in the state of Mississippi, and, and, and one month later, she moved into our house, and six months later, she became our official daughter. See, we, we didn't even really know her, but then everything began to change. Now, oh my goodness, now, two and a half years later, hello, okay, she's got a room in the house, all right? She's got our last name, all right? We're paying for her to go to school. We're paying for friends. And she is on my, please bless me, God, auto insurance policy. Somebody help me with that one. You see, in October of 2016, I didn't even really know her. I knew about her, but I didn't know her well. Oh, but now everything has changed because the relationship has changed. You see, God is not only a creator of the universe who created everything, including you and me, but God created you for relationship with him. He wants you to know him just like he knows you. And so today what I want to do is I want to show you um, three different levels, if you will, of believing in God, okay? Three different levels of relationship with God. Now, these, this is just my way of kind of helping illustrate and lay out the truth for today. But here's what I'm asking you to do. I want you to lean in, all right, lock in. I want you to listen. And I want you to be real honest today to identify where you are as a student, as a single parent, as a spouse, as a grandparent. Where are you in this spectrum of relationship with God? First confession, the first person category, if you will, says this, I believe in God, but don't know him. I believe in God, but don't know him. Quite honestly, that may be where some of you are today. You go, How, how's that even possible? Well, you can believe in God and still not know him. See, scripture says even the demons believe in God and they shudder. They believe in God, but they don't have a relationship with him as God intended for us to do. And so I would term this person, I would categorize this person as what we might call today a cultural Christian. A cultural Christian. It's somebody who says something like this, well, well I grew up and daddy was Baptist and mama was Catholic and she was Methodist. And so like, I mean, we went to church a good bit. Every Easter, we didn't miss an Easter at all. I can't remember one growing up. Christmas, we were there most of the time. We'd hit the big other holiday. Like, so I'm pretty sure I'm a Christian. Or, or they'd say something like this, well, I'm, I know I'm not a Muslim, no, I'm not that. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I think I'm a Christian. I, I love God, right? Or you know what? I mean, most everybody I know in, in this part of the country, like, I mean, they believe in God and stand for God. In God we trust. We sing God bless America. So I think, I think that's probably me. And we've adopted this kind of mindset just inadvertently as a culture that, well, I'm, I'm not really anything else. So I, I guess I'm a Christian, man. I, yeah, God, yeah, I believe in him, yeah. And we've stepped into this mindset, this idea of I believe in God, but maybe we don't really know him. See, in Scripture, John wrote some pretty significant words about this thing that's been going on really since the beginning of time. And here's what he says, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, John says this. He says, we know that we have come to know him, know God, if we keep his commands. Look at verse 4. Whoever says, I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. He says, whoever says, I know God, but their life doesn't produce fruit. In other words, there's no real sense of obedience. There's no real remorse when there's sin. There's no real confession of where they might be wrong. There's no transformation, okay? Now get me right, we, we, we don't do good to try to earn God's favor, 
But when we're in Christ, okay, we see the goodness of God and he, he does good things through us. And so for many people, we could say it this way, um, they claim to know God, but they, they don't really know him. And so really what's happened is they, they believe in Jesus, but yet they're not living a life that reflects that. And so if scripture says, if we claim to know God, but our life doesn't represent the teachings of Jesus, we lie about who we say we are. So the tragedy there is that there are many people who say, I believe in God and, and I do a lot of good things. And man, I know a lot of things about God but they still don't really know him. And I would even say that there's many people who know a lot about the Bible, but there's a chance they may miss heaven by about 18 inches. Because there's a lot of head knowledge of the things of God, but yet there's not a heart-true relationship with the God of the universe who created you to know him. See, Jesus said some very direct words about this in the book of Matthew. And I, I never like to use this verse or this passage as a, as a scare tactic because I don't think I should scare you out of hell. Man, if you're coming to Jesus, you better choose to come to Jesus. But yet Jesus spoke these words very clearly, very directly to those who are listening to him. And so I think it matters for you and me today. Look at Matthew 7, verse 21. Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but... Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, on that final day, on that judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Okay, today it might say like this. Well, did, Jesus, didn't we go to church? Didn't I, I do that class when I was 12? Like I was, I was baptized when I was a baby. I owned the Bible. I, pray, I gave some money. Like we try to do some good stuff. That's what we might say. And then Jesus responded this way. Look at what Jesus said. Then I will tell them plainly, verse 23, I never, look at it, knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. God says, you, you maybe try to do some good things. You maybe knew a lot about me, but you never really knew me. You never had relationship with me. And quite honestly, that may be where some of you are today. Man, I know God, I believe in God, but I don't really know him. There's a second person, and the second person says this, I believe in God and know him, but don't know him well. I believe in God and I know him, but I don't know him well. I've experienced God, but I don't know him intimately. See, I'll give you an example. At the end of uh, my time serving at my last church, we hosted a concert uh, with Chris Tomlin. Anybody heard the name Chris Tomlin before? Okay, quite a few people in the room. All right, like if not, you, know, you probably sung one of his songs like thousands of times, okay, at a church setting before. You, you've heard him on the radio, okay, decently a big deal, all right? And so like he came in concerts, pretty big thing, thousands of people were showing up. And, and also he brought with him a friend of his who was a pastor named Louis Giglio. Anybody ever heard the name Louis Giglio? Okay, like he's written a couple of books, planted this like kind of small church over in Atlanta, like a couple thousand people. And then he's like started this kind of passion movement thing. It's been going for a couple of decades, hundreds of thousands of college students connected to Jesus. And so like needless to say, Chris Tomlin, Louis Giglio, like they're up there, okay? All right, especially in the American church world. And so my role on the staff was that I, I would be interacting with them to help prepare for the concert, to help make sure everything happened. And so actually, the day of the concert, Chris and Louie, all right, we're going first name basis. Like, we, they were like, hey, we want some signature Mississippi food, like something that's signature Mississippi. We're like, oh, we got it. We got it, okay? Jerry's Catfish House. Like, does it get any more Mississippi than Jerry's Catfish Igloo, okay? That's it. All right, shout out to all my Highway 49 Florence folks in the room. Woo, Eagles in the house, all right? And so seriously, we loaded up and took Chris Tomlin and Louis Giglio to Jerry's Catfish House. They opened an hour early to serve Chris Tomlin fried catfish, all right? It was awesome. It was awesome. And like, like he took one bite, all right? Chris Tomlin took one bite into that fried goodness that is Jerry's Catfish, and he was like, how great is our God? I was like, I know, Chris. I know. All of Rankin County knows. They stand in line on Saturday nights for hours just for that right there. Some of you are like, you are lying. Okay, I got a picture. Look at that. That's Chris Tomlin at Jerry's Catfish House eating fried catfish. I don't know about the how great is our God part, but he probably sang it. Lou Giglio right there next to him, I promise you, okay? Listen, it was cool. I got to go eat catfish with Chris 
time. And so like we got a chance to talk a little bit. So I'm like, man, listen, like I'm, my wife and I were getting ready to help start a church. And he was like, dude, that's so cool. Like, that's awesome. And, and I was like, man, your music has been great. Like it's impacted me and my relationship with God. We've been to passion and we've listened to you lead worship. And so man, just so thankful. Inside, I'm like geeking out. Okay. The outside, I'm like, yeah, Chris, like, it was great. Okay. I'm playing it cool. But, but it's, so, it was so good. Like we really connected so much. So he gave me his email address. And he was like, he was like, hey man, listen, if you're in the Atlanta area, you know, sometime in the, in the near future, and shoot me an email, I'll see what's going on. And my wife and I would love to take you and your wife to dinner. And I was like, yes, you would. All right, all right. He's like, he's like, maybe we'll like, maybe we'll go see my studio or something. We'll hang out for a little while, talk about you know church stuff. And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And so sure enough, like about two years later, Heather and I were going to a trip to Atlanta. And so I was like, well, email, what the heck? So I shot him an email. All right, he replied. He replied. He's like, yes, let's do it. So on a Tuesday night, my wife and I went with Chris Tomlin and his wife to dinner in Atlanta. Went to go see his studio. I got a picture of that one too. Y'all got it? Go ahead and fire it. All right, the truth is, there's no picture. Because he didn't really invite us to Atlanta, and he didn't give me his email address. Now, here's the thing. I'm, I know Chris Tomlin, but I don't know him well. Like, I, I know some things about him. I've sung a whole bunch of his songs. I ate catfish with him for an hour at Jerry's, okay? But I don't know him real well. And for some of you, I mean, you, you've experienced God, okay? You, you know God, so you say. You, you've prayed some prayers, all right? You've heard a bunch of stories. You've done the church thing for a long time, but you don't really know God intimately. You don't really know him well. And today, we have to realize that while there are many people who have been informed about Jesus, there are yet still many who have never been transformed by him. You see, there's, there's a difference in being informed about Jesus and having your life transformed by him. Now, I'm not saying this person's maybe not in the family of God. Your sins haven't been forgiven. But I'm saying there are people who say, well, I know God, but they don't know him well. Paul was talking to a group of people that very well could have fallen into this category in the book of Galatians. And I want you to hear what Paul says to these people. Galatians 4 verse 8, he says this. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Verse 9, but now, now that you do know God, you know him, or rather you are known by God. How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? There's so many people, even in our little church family right here, who I love dearly, who sometimes I just want to look at you and go, why? You know God. So why do you keep turning back to the destructive things of the old life, the past life, that are destructive to you, that are hindering your witness and weakening your faith and pulling you away from the very relationship that God created you for? Why? You see, I'm so passionate about this because there was a point after I came to know God where I was in the same place. I mean, the, the things of the past were trying to pull me back in. And God's going, no, I created you for this life. And the past is going, no, but this looks better, don't it? And I, I, I was being tempted to turn to the past. And listen to me, that's where some of you are today. And you're taking steps, some known, some unknown, towards a lifestyle that's not who God called you to be. It's not who you proclaimed to be when you were 12, when you were 16, or for some of you, even six months ago. I mean, God's called us to be new in Him. And if you knew Him well, you wouldn't be perfect, but you would be being perfected by His presence and His Spirit and His Word in your life. The biblical word is sanctified. You know what that means? Every day you're becoming more like Jesus. That's knowing Him and knowing Him well. You see, there are those who believe in God they don't know him. And that may be some of you. But there's some who believe in God and they know him, but they don't know him well. And again, that may be many of you. But the third category, man, where I hope we all will desire to be is this. I believe in God and know him intimately and serve him wholeheartedly. 
I believe in God and I know him intimately. And man, with my life, I'm, I'm serving him wholeheartedly. See, there's, there's some of you who are probably in that category. But for you today, because you understand the sanctification thing, you're like, man, I, just, I don't know that I'm there yet. Like, I'm, I'm still growing. I'm not there yet. But, but you resonate perhaps with this imagery right here. Like for you, you're one who understands what it means to be led by the Spirit of God in your life. You, you literally know what it means to walk by faith and, and not by sight. You know what it means to be, to be gently convicted of your sin and to quickly turn and ask for forgiveness for that thing. You know what it means to wake up and say, God, I want my day, this day, my Monday, to glorify you more than to me. And you know what it's like to have God's presence with you like every, every day of your day. You know what it feels like to be interrupted by God. You know what it's like for him to prompt you to have a conversation that otherwise you wouldn't have had. You know what it's like to, to pray for people that you never thought about praying for before. You know what it's like to feel him prompt you. You know what it's like to have his, have his comfort in your life when something goes wrong. And then you have this in, sur, insurmountable amount of peace that comes not from the world, but comes from him because you know him and there's a relationship with him. You know that when you're weak, it's really only his strength that can make you strong. You know his word and his word is in your life and it's nourishment to your life. You've hidden it in your heart so that you wouldn't sin against God. And even though you know it and you've heard it, you can't get enough of it because it is literally nourishment for your soul as much as you need a sandwich. You need the word of God in you, growing in you. Worship, is not, it's not something you do for an hour on Sunday. Like it's, it's who you are. It's the overflow of you because God's changed you. It's like, man, I worship every day. It's my life. It's not always a song, but it's who I am. You don't have to go to church for that. And you begin to realize you, you long for every part of your day to glorify God. And at the end of the day, it's not about how much you got done or how you feel or how tired you are, but it's this, it's this honest prayer as you walk in him to go, God, God, I, I just pray that there was something that I did today that grew me to be more like you or honored you with what I did. Listen to me. If that's you, you're not perfect. You're not better than everybody else, but you are walking intimately with God. You know him. You know him well, and he knows you. See, I, I love the imagery that David used. Psalm 63. David, he was a man who, who loves God. I want you to hear a man who loves God, who, who was seeking God, like he needed God. It wasn't a church thing for him. It was like, this is a daily who I am. Listen to what David writes, Psalm 63, verse 1. He says, you, God, are my God. He meant it personally. He's like, you, you are my God, and earnestly I seek for you. Man, I, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. It's not just a head knowledge. I mean, my, it's my desire to know you. Because I'm in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I've seen you, seen you move before in the sanctuary. I've seen your power, I've beheld it and your glory. But because your love is better than life. In other words, like, man, there's nothing the world offers. No promotion, no job, no salary, no, no relationship that's better than what your love is for me, God. He says, because your love is better than life, what's going to happen? My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. In other words, it's happened in here. It's real in here. And it's got to come out. That is the imagery of someone who is not perfect, who didn't have it all together, who messed up a good bit, but who knew God intimately. And man was longing to serve him wholeheartedly. Did you hear that? God, I long for you. Like, earnestly, God, I'm seeking you. And listen to me, that is so different than, I believe in God, yeah. So different. You see, there's some who say, man, I believe in God, but you don't know him. There's some of you who say, well, I, I believe in him, and I know him, there's this time, okay. But you don't know him well. And there's some of you who, who would say, man, I believe in God, but I know him intimately. Because of his grace, because of his power in my life, man, I'm choosing to serve him wholeheartedly. So we're in church for you. Like, how, how well do you know him? As a dad, high school student, single parent, grandparent, like, how well do you know him? I want to kind of give you a, a test for you to gauge maybe where you are today to help clarify some things. You see, what you call God determines how well you know him. What you call God determines how well you know him. 
How you address God is an indicator of how well you know him. <clears throat> Most scholars believe that David wrote Psalm 9, the same David that wrote Psalm 63, wrote Psalm 9. Here's what Psalm 9 verse 10 says. Look at it. It says, those who know, okay, know your name, do what? Trust in you. Those who intimately know the name of God, trust in God. That's what David says. Man, I know you, God. I trust in you. Okay. So for example, what you call me really helps me know like how close we are, whether you really know me or not. Okay. Like if I get a phone call in the afternoon, in the evening, I pick it up and it says, hello, Mr. May. And I'm like, all right, okay, that you're a telemarketer. You don't know me. Therefore, we're not going to talk. Okay. Like we're not having this conversation. I know. I don't care. But we're still, no, I don't, no, no, listen, I don't care. But we're going to give you a deal. No, 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 you're not. Okay. You don't know me. So we're not going to talk. Now, for some of you, you, would, you might call me Pastor Bryant. Okay, a lot of you, you call me Pastor Brian. Now, here's what that means. That means you're potentially like a part of our church family here. Okay, you've listened to me run my mouth a good bit. All right, you know a little bit about me. You know some things about me. You know, like I'm married to my wife, Heather. Okay, she's a lot prettier than I am. You know, I got two kids. You know, I'm an Alabama fan. You know some things about me, okay? And so you would call me, hey, Pastor Brian. And there's some of you who just, man, you just walk up and you just call me Bryant. Okay, believe it or not, like not everybody calls me. My kids don't wake up in the morning and go, Pastor Brian, like how are you doing today? No, that's not what they say, okay? Like, not everybody calls me that. There's some people who just, they just call me Brian. And, like, we're, we're pretty close. Like, they, they know a good bit about my life. I probably shared some things with them. Now, there, there's a deeper level of that for a certain group of people, and they just call me B-May, okay? Like, now, if you call me B-May, that means we go back about 20 years. Like, we, were, we, were pro we probably played some ball together. We probably, like, were knuckleheaded seventh grade boys together, like middle school kids in the youth group together, went on some trips, okay, went multiple days without showers, okay, talked about bodily noises and functions more than normal humans should, okay, because we were seventh grade, like, we had a bond, okay, and it went deep, and so, like, you might call me B-Man. Now, you, if you just know me a little bit, you can't call me B-Man. It doesn't register, okay? You got to go way back with me, okay? You got to go seventh grade. Now, there, there are some, two particularly, okay? Who call me daddy. And, and they know me in a way that none of you do. Like, because we share time together. We, we've gone on vacation together. We just got back from vacation. Like, we, we've cried together. We've laughed together a whole lot. Okay? We've walked around the house together without our makeup on. Okay? All right? We, we've spent a lot of time together. We've had some bedtime serious talks before. We've prayed together more than I pray with anybody else. And so they get the right to call me daddy. Now, there's one and she calls me hunk of hunk of burning love, all right? <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that, because she's the only one who could call me that. <laughs> but she knows me on a level that no one else does. You see, what you call God reflects how well you know him. And so if you pray to him and just say, hey, man, he's kind of the big man upstairs, it probably reflects what your relationship with God looks like. If you say, man, he's, he's the big guy in the sky, like he's in control, holding it all together, probably reflects kind of what your relationship looks like. But if you call out to him intimately, his father, probably reflects what he means to you. For some of you, man, you, you call him Savior. God, you are my Savior because he has, he has rescued you from sin, and it's real. For some of you, you might call him friend. Because he was there for you when nobody else was. For some of you, it's healer. You are my healer, God, because he has supernaturally healed your body. For some of you, it might be provider, because he came through when you didn't think anybody else would. For some of you, it's comforter. God, you are my king and you are my Lord. You see, what you call God reflects on your relationship with him and how well you really know him. And suddenly, when you begin to know him intimately, it's no longer, well, dear God, but it's Father, Daddy. You see, Jesus called God Abba, Father. Jesus knew God as Daddy. And just like my kids call me, hey, Dad, maybe for some of you, you long for, maybe it's a reality, that's who God is to you. Hey, Daddy God, because maybe your Daddy isn't here anymore. Or maybe he never really was a dad for you, but you know God on that intimate level. What you call him determines how well you know him. And listen to me, when you get to know him better, it begins to change things about you. It begins to change the things that you care about. All of a sudden, you start caring for those who are outcast or overlooked. 
You wake up one day and you're like, man, I didn't even really think about the poor before, but like now I'm concerned for those people who are in need around me. You begin to be convicted of your sin and you, you immediately turn to God and you ask for forgiveness where you find grace and forgiveness. You go, oh, God, I'm sorry. And then you leave that thing behind. You know what it's like to have him prompt you during your day. You hear his voice encouraging you, loving you, directing you, and correcting you. You begin to pray for people that you didn't even know to pray for before. You begin to experience his presence just throughout your day. It's not like I got to wait till Sunday at 10. Like it's Tuesday at 3 and he's with me. And no longer is it like, oh, I got to go to church. No, it's like, I am the church. I'm the body of Christ. He dwells in me. I'm the temple. And I don't have to worship for an hour on Sundays. This is who I am. It flows out of me. And you begin to realize that he's uniquely wired you and gifted you with different personalities and resources to give back to him through others. And it's not just money. Okay, It's not just your money because it's like it's not my money anyway. Like it's his money. Like I'm, I'm trusting him with that through the church. It's, it's my talent, my resources that he's given to me. And you begin to realize like I, I'm, I'm not just a Christian. Like I'm word says I'm a minister. No, I don't work at the church. Like, no, I'm just a minister. Like, I've got the Spirit of God in me. And if I'm walking this thing out with Him in me, then I'm giving it back. I'm serving. I'm walking this thing out. And all throughout the day, the Spirit of God is real in you. And you sense it because you know Him intimately. And you are longing to serve Him wholeheartedly. And listen to me. The good news today is He doesn't make it hard. It's not a hide-and-seek game. He says in his word, he says, if you seek me, okay, if, that's a big word for some of us, you seek, that's action many of us need to take, if you seek me, you will find me. You'll find me. Some of you today, you know God, or you believe God, believe in him, but you don't know him. And man, you're, you're one decision away from experiencing the joy of relationship with God. Some of you, you believe in God, you know him, but you don't know him well. I mean, you're one decision, one step of surrender away from stepping into that kind of relationship where it changes everything about who you are. It's the way God intended it to be. See, in Ephesians, Paul prays a so that prayer. He prays a prayer so that this thing will happen. As we begin this series today, here's my so that prayer for you today. Ephesians 1, 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, look at that word, that He may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Here it is. So that you may know Him better. I mean, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened in order that or so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for who? For us who do what? Believe and know. I pray today then that God would give you the spirit of wisdom, of revelation, that he would enlighten you. Why? So that you could know our really good, good God even better. Because you see, it honors God when his children know him. And when we know him and we walk in that, he guides us into all truth. So I pray for you today so that you might know God intimately and choose to serve him wholeheartedly.